Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about compression testing. So we perform compression testing to get compression properties. Tensile and compression properties have been proven to be different. For tensile testing, we use a dog bone specimen. For compression, we are going to use a specimen called slug. So slug is simply a cylinder. Can you think of why we are not using a dog bone to do compression testing? You're right, the dog bone will buckle. And while buckling is a mode of failure in compression, but in compression testing, we are not interested in finding buckling properties, but compressive properties. So we have to isolate the mode of failure of interest, which is compression. Rectangular coupons are also commonly used for compression testing, but for that one, we need to use specific grips that makes only a small portion of our coupon available and then the rest are protected by the grip. So we place our specimen, the slug, on a compression machine which is simply a simply two plates the top and the bottom and then the top plate is going downwards and applying uh, compression or compressive force but there are two points in compression that is different than tensile testing one is the beginning of the test And the, the other one is the end of the test. So for the beginning, the plate is going down until it touches the surface of our specimen. But how do we know when the test has begun? We need to put a criteria. So the criterion that we are going to use is a force criterion. Whenever our machine senses 25 pounds, that means that the surface has been touched. That's our surface detection criteria. So 25 pounds seems to work well for our steel and aluminum specimens. Uh, but if you have a polymer, you might want to use a lower criterion. So this fourth criterion tells us whenever the machine senses four pound, 25 pounds, that means that the surface has been detected and the software starts to record data. If you assign a very low value, let's say we assign one pound, then the machine might detect air, air friction as the specimen surface and it starts recording data and that would be incorrect. And if you assign, let's say 100 pound, the machine has already applied pressure into a specimen, so we are losing the beginning of our stress strain curve. So that's up to you and the specimen to what criteria you're going to use. The other important distinction between compression and tension is the end of the test. The end of the test for... Uh, Tensile testing is very obvious. The sample breaks into two pieces. But what about a compression testing? How do we know when to stop the test? The easiest way is to assign a displacement criterion, saying that if the height is, let's say, let me write, if the height is 0.75, Whenever the displacement reaches half of the height, means 0.375 inch, then we stop the test. And we are sure that by reaching 
half of its height, the specimen has deformed enough so we can get our mechanical properties. So when we change our force displacement into a stress strain curve, we can get similar mechanical properties from our uh, compression testing. But one distinction is that you're not going to see a drop in stress as similar to uh, tensile testing. Uh, because after some point, the machine is compressing against itself. So here, our stress strain curve does not represent our material properties, but the machine properties against itself. So it's very important to cut our data here whenever the slope is changing. Sometimes it's very difficult to report ultimate uh, compression because of that reason that we can't tell the end of the test. So here, let's call this ultimate compression. This one would be the modulus. Experimental results have shown that the tensile modulus and compression modulus have to be theoretically the same. Here, because for tension and compression, we are using different specimens, they've been man manufactured differently, so we don't expect it to be identical, uh, but they should be close. But the ultimate tension and compression are not necessarily the same. I mean, some materials have uh, closer properties in tension and compression, and some materials like uh, concrete, they're going to have vastly different properties. Concrete is very good in compression, but not so much in tension. And that's the reason we reinforce concrete with steel bar to make sure that in addition to compression properties, we get good tensile properties as well. And that's why we do compression testing as well to get the properties in tension and compression. And here in this lab, in addition to compressive properties, we look them over different strain rate to see how these properties, such as elastic modulus, such as ultimate tension, are uh, changing with different strain rate. If the strain rate increases, are these properties going to go up or down? Is it the same as uh, tensile testing or it's uh, different? The other uh, important thing to, to note is that the dimension of our specimens after testing. Let's say this is our slug. We have an initial radius of R1 and height 1. Then after testing, you're going to get a different height and different radius. We know the height. We put our criterion as H2 would be half of H1. So we know H2, we are going to deform our specimens on, until H2 reaches half of H1. But what would be the radius? If we assume that the volume is the same, because there would be conservation of the material, the volume is not going to change, then pi R1H, that's the volume of a cylinder, should be equal to pi R2. H2. Then we know H2 is half of H1. Then you can find R2 based on R1. And remember, this is based on the assumption that the volume is the same, which is not a bad assumption. I mean, the mass is probably the better to say the mass is the same, but then we have the density issue. The density might change. Uh, but it would be a good assumption to just say volumes are, are the same. So we could predict the final radius. But when we look at our sample, our samples are not going to be cylindrical after the testing. They're going to take a barrel shape. And can you tell why they're going to have a shape of a barrel? 
That's because of the friction. We have friction forces that resist the motion at the top and the bottom. In the middle, it's free to deform. But here we have frictional forces that resist the motion. So at the end, we are going to have a barrel shape. If we are going to remove the effect of friction or let's say minimize it, we could use lubrication we could add lubricate these regions and then we are going to see a much closer shape to a to a cylinder so a couple of important things for compression testing uh, first is the beginning and the end the beginning is the fourth criteria the end is a displacement criteria because we don't know what force is causing our specimens to uh, to deform uh, under compression. We could calculate that, but it's much easier to assign a displacement criteria. The other thing is that the shape of a stress strain curve is not the same as tensile testing. After some point, the machine is just compressing against itself. Our specimen has completely yielded and... Uh, uh, compressed. So we need to remove those regions from uh, our stress strain curve. And one way to do it is looking at the slope. The slope gives us the stiffness. So if the stiffness changes after plastic deformation, that means that that would be our uh, machine properties, not our specimen properties. The other thing is that we look at plastic modulus, ultimate tension. Uh, we can look at here, we don't have area reduction. We have area expansion. We have a fa uh, strain to failure, uh, so we could report uh, other values as well, but the most two important ones are elastic modulus and ultimate tension.